that which we didn't have before and God God knew the need would be there and God gave us exactly what we needed he even does small things like fixing our furnace so it's not over there raging while we're trying to listen during the service you know I mean God's in the details isn't it fun to serve a God who's in control and who knows what's going on and knows what we need and knows the exact timing when we need it? We've had the joy this year of seeing several people take a step of commitment and become members of the church. And that's been exciting. We've had the blessing of seeing several baptisms this year where people are stepping up and identifying with Jesus and saying it's only through Jesus alone. We had the opportunity yesterday at Lorna's Memorial service for Ron to, to give the gospel. And there were some people here who needed to hear the gospel. And, you know, there's something about being able to just tell people that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And that no man comes under the Father but by him. They just need to hear that. They may not appreciate it. They may not even accept it, but they just need to hear it. And when people get up here and they stand here and they give testimony and they go in the baptismal waters, they're saying, yes, I am, I am committed in identifying with this one Jesus who is my Savior. And that's what brings us together. And these kids did it this year. It was awesome. And many of you did that. And so we've had that privilege. We've had the privilege of having a couple sets of parents stand up here and say, listen, we're dedicating ourselves to raising our kid for Jesus, directing him in that, in that way. And by God's grace, those kids will come to know Christ as their personal Savior. In general, we've had faithful attendance. We've had faithful giving. You're going to see that. In fact, there's a, a budget back there. Uh, that's proposed for next year that you can look at today if you want. Our business meeting is going to be in a couple of weeks. We'll be talking about that. We'll be talking about some new leadership. We've already mentioned that, about the Russells and Brian coming on. And we're also looking at a couple new deacons, Chad and Stephen. I want you to pray about that. Uh, exciting things coming down the road here. Uh, faithful service. You know, every week, or almost every week, people are serving here in music. And that takes a lot of time to put together. It's not like it used to be. You just grab a hymnal and grab a piano and you're all done. Uh, that, was, that, was some, that was really nice, really, <laughs> as far as the ease of it. <laughs> but uh, we have people serving in youth every week, junior church. My wife's up there right now with these kids so that they're not down here distracting you, right? Trying to pour into them the word at, at their level. There's people in the nursery, there's people greeting, there's people doing hospitality, there's people doing discipleship. Sunday school is going to start up next week, right, 945. We're looking forward to that. After church, someone's counting the money, people are taking attendance, people are making coffee, and, and all these things are happening. And we just praise the Lord that so many people are willing to be involved in contributing to the ministry so that we can all be encouraged and gather together on a weekly basis. And throughout the week. So thank the Lord that he's working in our midst. And we serve a God who's alive. And a God who changes us. And a God who makes a difference. And we want to see that difference continue to spread. And we want to make an impact by God's grace here. So we praise the Lord for that. And I hope that we will continue to, to grab a hold of this vision of what God has brought us here for. To, to impact other people, to impact each other. We've been, we, I gave you that little bookmarker with all the names of people in our church. It's, still, it's already outdated, but um, so that we could be interacting with each other through prayer, right? Taking people's names to Jesus and saying, Lord, please pray for, I, I mean, I'm praying for these people. Please bless these people here that are part of my family, my spiritual family, part of this church. We need to be praying for each other. Sometimes we just pray for people that are in trouble <laughs> or sick, right? We need to pray for people that are healthy, people that are doing good. We all need prayer. So we're going to encourage you this coming year to, to do more than pray, to start mixing it up a little bit, invite some people over. Go out to dinner with some people. Get involved with some of the people in our church. Not just Sundays, but, you know, sometime during the week. We need it. 
We need that fellowship. So we must remember that our purpose here as a church is not only something that could be done, it's something that must be done. And if we don't do it, it's not going to get done. In this, in this city, God could raise somebody else up, obviously, to do what he wants to be done. But he's raised us up, he's brought us together as Grace Fellowship Church so that we can be the messengers of truth that will change people's lives and how desperately they need it. Because experience, experiences alone are not going to get you to heaven. Right? It's not about feelings. I mean, there's a lot of songs about feelings. I just felt so good. <laughs> I don't care if you feel good or not. Do you know Jesus? Do you love Jesus? Right? Sometimes that doesn't even feel that good, especially when he's pointing out something in your life that you should change. And he's growing you and he's taking you through some discipline maybe or through a hard time. It doesn't always feel good, but it is good because our God is good. So it must be done. And I tried to simplify our purpose as a church. We've said on mission for worship and service. On mission, we're on mission together, that reach, beach, and teach thing, the Great Commission, for worship and service. And what I mean by that is that we need more worshipers. God is seeking worshipers, and God is seeking more servants. A worshiper, a true worshiper, is somebody that loves God, and a true servant is someone that loves others. And obviously, we all have to be growing in that ourselves if we're going to help anybody else with it. We have to be worshiping God more. We have to be loving God more ourselves if we're going to encourage someone else to do that. Hebrews talks about provoking one another to love and good works. And certainly we need to do that. But I can't provoke you to something that I'm not doing. If I don't really love Jesus, you know, you, you just stop and consider Matthew 22, which I'm going to read to you in a moment, uh, and, and ask yourself, do I love God with all my heart, soul, and mind? And what does that even mean? But that's part of my purpose. That's why I'm here. The verse says... I don't think, I think I put it up there. Um, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. And you know this, the, the setting of this. Uh, the Pharisees were questioning Jesus and trying to test him. And they said, what is the greatest, what is the greatest commandment? What is the greatest commandment? What is, what is the thing we should focus on the most? And Jesus who knows everything, said, this is it. This is it. Focus on this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. That's the greatest commandment. That's the most important thing in life. That's the thing you should be aiming at. That's the thing we should be working at. And second to that is love your neighbor as yourself, and as we know, that is the overflow of the other. I'm reminded, uh, I was just reminded this week that sometimes we focus more on man-made slogans or mottos like on mission for worship and service than we do the, the actual verse. And I don't want that to be what we do. I want us to learn the verse. Now, the whole verse isn't up there. The whole verse says, And Jesus said to him, Love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the greatest and most important command. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Because all the law and prophets depend on these two commandments. Memorize that verse, right? That's what we need to memorize. That's what we need to meditate. That's what we need to think about. And asking ourselves on a daily basis, Do I love the Lord my God? with all my heart, with all my soul, and with all my mind. And I may have to ask myself, what does that even mean? What does that look like? You know? Love my neighbor as myself. Because said our, we are on mission for love. Or we're on mission for lovers because that's what Jesus is talking about, love. But how do we know if we're loving like this? And I think worship and service are great litmus tests. You've probably heard the expression, they worship 
the ground that he walks on, and they will do anything he says. Right? The husband worships the ground his wife walks on. It's not a bad thing. Or they worship the ground that their boss walks on, or whoever it is, or some cult leader, and that's when it gets real dangerous, right? That's a dangerous statement if, if, it's, if it's about somebody that's human, but what if it's God? And that's really what we need to do. We need to worship the ground that he walked on, so to speak, and do whatever he tells us to do. Loving the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, and mind. Because the more we learn about God, the more we're going to love him. We can't help but love him. And worship is the highest form of love. To worship something is to prize it above everything else. To honor it as the thing of highest importance and to act accordingly. And when we respond to God in this way, we know that we love him. Are we worshiping God? Are you worshiping God in your, in your private life? On a daily basis, are you taking time to worship God? Worship, worth -ship. God is worthy of our admiration and our praise and, and the honor that we can give to him. And in 2023, we need, to, we need to stop and say, okay, have I taken time to worship my God? Do I really love him? Am I demonstrating that through my response to him? Because there's no one else like him. Knowing him as creator is enough to worship him because he's an awesome sovereign creator, but to know him as your loving father who rescued you and brought you out of the sinful lifestyle that you were in and has put you on this path now where you're knowing peace and joy like never before. Loving him. Someone said Jesus plus nothing equals everything. Jesus plus nothing. It goes contrary <laughs> to the thoughts of of many here in our community. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. And that's why we love him. Because everything we need is found in Jesus. We don't have to look anywhere else. There's nothing else we have to do. We don't have to work harder. We just have to believe. We have to trust. We have to depend and rely completely on him. It's not if I did enough. If, what, is it, what is it I need to do more? Could I have done better? What if I do this? Jesus is enough. And we love and worship God because even though we were like sheep going astray and falling short of the glory of God and we had no intention of seeking him and no intention of calling on him for help, he still loved us. He still loved us and he called us and he saved us. And Romans 5, 8 says, But God proves his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for you. And Christ died for me. And when he died, he said it is finished. And he completed and he did everything that needed to be done to satisfy the wrath of God, which God pours out on sin so that we could be freed from the penalty of sin and we could now have this relationship with the Lord. He did it for us. Christ made a way for enemies to be friends and for orphans to have a family and for unpayable debts to be paid and for despair to turn to hope and most importantly for sins to be forgiven and for us to have eternal life. Jesus did that. How could we not love him and want to share that message with other people? And you know as well as I do and probably better that there's many people around us here with problems and addictions and insecurities and overwhelming burdens and false hopes and bitter memories. And we must love them enough to find ways to get the true message of the gospel to them. God commands us to do it. We're to love our neighbor as ourselves. Now, I just want to thank the folks that came yesterday and supported Lorna here at the funeral, the memorial service. Um, that's part of it, supporting one another, being involved in each other's lives. The stuff in the back here, this is stuff from the memorial service that you may want to look at afterwards. Some of the artwork they did and things as we remembered Ron and, and his life yesterday. It was a wonderful thing. So loving one another is, starts within our community, but it goes beyond our community to the communities around us. 
And God has called us to do that. Because God is a lover. God is a lover. And we love him because he first loved us. Isn't it awesome to think that God loves you? When no one else may love you, God does. When you're feeling down, when you feel like you've just blown it, when you feel like you can't do anything right, God still loves you. That's why we love him. Because he first loved us. Others desperately need to hear that. There's people out there that don't know if they're going to make it. They don't know. They don't know what the answers are. They just think it's about working harder, doing more, trying to be perfect, trying to be worthy. We need to know our community. We need to know our people. We need to be loving our neighbors. Sometimes we get so caught up with our own life, we've we we've, we've, haven't learned how to live by faith, really. We're not really trusting God for everything we need. And because we're not trusting every, God for everything we need, then we don't have the liberty to love other people like we should. And so we need to continue to grow in our faith so we're not so busy taking care of ourselves that we ignore other people around us. Many religious people around us talk about God. They talk about God a lot. But when Jesus was addressing the religious leaders of his day, he said this, The people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. They worship me in vain. They worship in vain. We live in a land where there's a lot of vain worship going on, and it's very, very dangerous. They're clinging to a religion that doesn't help them know God. And Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. And on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name and drive out demons in your name and do many miracles in your name? And then I will announce to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you lawbreakers. Now listen, we're all lawbreakers. Everybody in this room is a lawbreaker. We've all broken God's law, right? We all fall under that category. The difference is, if you've trusted in Christ and you're in Christ, he has fulfilled the law for you. He's paid the price for your sin. And God's will for us is to trust in the work his son did on the cross. That's what God's will is for us. And if we don't do that, we will be condemned as lawbreakers. And when we stand before Jesus someday, he's going to say, I never knew you because you didn't trust in my son Jesus as the only way, truth, and life. And nobody's going to come unto me unless they come through Jesus. And that's the message that we need to get out. And it's all part of this disciple-making process. We see it in Matthew 28, 19, and 20. It says, go. Therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And, and remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. So there's three parts here to this Great Commission. The Great Commission is make disciples. We are to make disciples. It starts out by the go. With the word go, as you know, that's about as you are going... Declaring the truth of Jesus to the people around you, basically. We call that reach. We're reaching. We're here. There's a purpose bigger than us. Part of that purpose is to be reaching people with truth. Telling them truth they won't hear anywhere else. Because the best many people have to offer is stories of things that have happened in their life. If you're invited over to some of your neighbor's houses... And they will start telling you stories of things that happened in their lives. And that's it. That's all they got. They don't have a testimony of coming to the end of themselves and realizing that they're spiritually bankrupt and understanding that Jesus paid the penalty for their sin and putting their faith and trust in him. They don't have that testimony. They have all kinds of testimonies, but it doesn't come back to that. And even yesterday we, we uh, were reminded that The church that's in town believes that after a person dies, there's other ordinances you need to do for that person so that somehow he can make it to heaven. We don't believe that, right? It's either you trust Christ as your personal Savior or you don't. 
And when you die, it's done. This is it. I can't pray you in later. You've got to trust Christ as your personal Savior now. And I know most of you have here this morning, and praise the Lord that we can bond together through that, but that message needs to be declared wherever we have an opportunity to those around us. And that's really that reaching, that going. It's knowing the message. So it's critical that you know the message of the gospel, that you know how to communicate the true gospel. Not some plan of all these things you have to do, but the true gospel of what Jesus did for you. We have to know it in order to communicate it. And our job is to simply communicate it. We can't save anybody. We can just give out the truth. And we allow God then, or we don't allow him, but he then does what he needs to do. Really, if you've lived here more than a year and you don't know what your neighbors believe, you need to get on the stick. There's lots of resources that tell us what our neighbors believe, and we shouldn't always have to rely on Jamie. <laughs> it's good that she can share it with us and tell us, right? But there's lots of resources that we need to understand what they believe so that when we hear them commuting, communicating to us, we can kind of sort through the language and understand where they're coming from. That's the going part. The second part is baptizing them, right? And I like to call that beach because to, I, in the vision of my mind, I have all these boats floating around out in the ocean somewhere. And yeah, maybe they've trusted Christ, but we need to bring them in and dock them. People need to be docked. They need stability. They need to be in a body. They need to be together with other Christians. And baptizing is when they come and publicly announce to a church body that they're identifying with Jesus Christ. And membership is when they come and they publicly say, I want to be part of this group and I want to work with you, right? So we need to beach people. We need to get people plugged into a, to a body, to a place where they can be encouraged. That's part of what we're here for. There's a lot of people floating around, even believers floating around, that need to get plugged into a church. And they need someone to come alongside them and say, hey, why don't you come over with us? You're discouraged, you're having trouble, you're struggling. We're not perfect, but we, we want you to come. We want you to be here. The beach part. And then there's the teach part, which is obvious because it says teaching. Teaching them to observe and to obey. You see, we're all disciples, and disciple is by definition a learner. So we're all in this process of learning. No matter where you are in your believer, as a believer, you need to learn more. More about God so you can love him more. Learn more about the gospel so you can love your neighbor more. We're all disciples. And we want discipleship to be kind of the culture of our church. By that I mean people one-on-one -on -one working with each other, encouraging each other in the Lord. However, whatever that looks like, it, it happens informally, it happens formally, but it should be happening church-wide. You either need to be discipling somebody or you need to be getting discipled or maybe both, right? Both can happen. And if someone's investing time in you, then you need to be looking for somebody you can invest time in. It doesn't have to be a lot. It could be 45 minutes a week that you just spend some time with somebody and you just pour into their life a little bit and, and help them know their love and encourage them and, and speak some truth into their life. And maybe... You have someone else that's doing that to you, and, and that's what the church should look like. That's what it's about. You know, we have, we have jobs, and I know you all have to make a living, but, you know, the reason we do that is because we have to support ourselves so that we can do the things that are really important. There's a bigger purpose. You know, we don't live to work. We work so that we can live. And really living is serving our king and being involved in his purpose for us. So as a church, God is doing some good things. And God is helping us to see that expand. And in a recent count, I, I counted at least 13 people that are actually actively involved in discipling other people that I know of in this church, and that's not even talking about the informal things that are going on. Right, so that's awesome. That's awesome. We just want that to expand. Because there's a joy in that. There's a joy in loving others. There's a joy in discipling and reaching out and encouraging and helping other people that you don't get when you're just focused on yourself. We just get in the rat race and we just get focused on the daily duties that we have and, and then we get discouraged. And the answer to that is to get our focus back on the Lord, loving him and then looking for someone else that we can love, loving others. 
What is your job in the church? We can sum it up in one word. People. That's your job, people. Whatever that looks like. We all have different talents and skills and gifts. We interact with people differently. So it's not going to look the same, but your job is people. Your job is to love others. Your job is to reach out. Your job is to communicate truth where you have an opportunity, whether it's believers or unbelievers. We all need it. We all need to hear the truth. And we need it together. We desperately need it. Sometimes that means reaching out of your comfort zone. I get that. I don't like it any more than you do. All right, there's a few people here that are extroverts. That's good. Thank God for the extroverts. They chat it up. You know, go chat it up, but make sure you're in your, all you're chatting, you're chatting about Jesus some, right? And if you're an introvert, make sure you find a way to do it. I don't care if you'd rather be under the rock. Jesus said love others. So at least pull somebody under the rock with you or whatever it takes <laughs> to get the message out. Snuggle together under the rock. I don't know what it's going to take, but we need to get busy about what God's called us to do because every believer is a disciple and every believer needs to be part of the disciple-making process. Praise God there's something bigger than us for us to invest in. Praise God there's something bigger than us to get up every day for. Right? You're gonna, if, you're, if you're climbing the, the business ladder right now, guess what? You're going to get to the top and be disappointed. That's just how it is. You know, there's nothing wrong with excelling in your business and excelling in what you're doing. But that is not going to give you the ultimate joy and contentment that only God can give. It's just a means and a way of serving Jesus. It's giving you a network. It's giving you people to contact. It's giving you people to rub shoulders with. Right? And that's where the joy is. When you come in here and you see a bunch of people here and we're all worshiping God, that's, that's exciting. Why? Because it's not something that happens naturally. It's impossible. It's impossible that 100 people would want to come here and sit here and sing songs to God. But God has done a supernatural work, and he continues to do it, and we rejoice in him. So as we look at 2023, I just want to, add to, I want to ask you this morning to partner with me in doing God's purpose, which starts with your own relationship with Jesus. It starts with your love for him. If you don't love Jesus, then you won't be a disciple, or at least you won't be an effective one. We must have time with Jesus alone. You must spend time with Jesus. You must spend time in the Word, and you will never regret when you do. It'll bring the greatest joy there is. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes you don't feel like you get anything out of it. Right? I understand there's those dry times that it all happens, but long-term, marathon-like run, you will come out at the right place, and you will know that that direction was the right direction. Partner with me as we strive to reach out, as we in our church work together, as we try to fellowship more, as we try to disciple each other, and as we try to reach out to our neighborhood. Why? So that more people will end up worshiping our great God and that more people will end up serving one another. And it has to be in that order because there's a lot of service going on, a lot of people serving people in our community, but there's not a lot of people worshiping God, right? Not in the right way. And that's our goal, to get more people to love Jesus and to worship him together. So Grace Fellowship Church, we are special people. And we have a great God, and we have a great future. And we don't know exactly what that looks like, but it's only going to get better as we keep him first in our lives. So let's pray. Father, thank you this morning. Thank you for your word, these verses that we know very well, but yet, Lord, we need to be reminded of them and brought back to them regularly because it's so easy to get off track. It's so easy to just get involved in side tangents and go down side streets and and not stay on the main highway and do the main things that you've called us to do. Lord, I realize that the people here in our church, Lord, they have they have a lot of things they're trying to balance and a lot of uh, plates are trying to juggle here. And Lord, I pray that you would just give wisdom and and you would give strength and you would help them to know how that they can be successful in serving you here. First of all, Lord, and how they can draw closer to you, love you more, 
Lord, how they can love their neighbor better. Lord, we, we need your help. We're desperate. We can't do this on our own. But we thank you that you always give us and enable us to do the things that you've called us to do, that you've commanded us to do. So we, we look to you this morning, and we thank you. And we pray at the beginning of this year in 2023 that you would make this the best year this church has ever had. Lord, I pray specifically, Lord, that you would bring us some people who would trust you as personal Savior, that we would see some souls saved this year, that you would change some lives, and that we as a group of believers would grow together closer than ever before, and that we would see your power at work here, and we'll thank you for that in Jesus' name.